That was just a test. OK. So if you come back the same time tomorrow, you get that one. All right, let's try that again. Um, so today, I'm doing the Livet dri driver KVM, or Livet KVM driver update. Um, so what that's going to entail, uh, so primarily, uh, we're, gonna, we're here to focus on the Kilo features, obviously. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of an architecture refresher, uh, so a refresh of how the driver fits into OpenStack, um, how the driver works, and also how Libvirt and KVM work as well. Uh, after that, I'll dive into some Kilo features, uh, primarily around the performance tuning enhancements um, for virtual machine guests that we've done in this release, uh, and also some Liberty uh, predictions slash speculation. So obviously, um, alongside the general summit this week, uh, we have the design summit, which is the primary forum in which we uh, define the agenda for the next release. So none of these things are really confirmed, obviously. Um, so obviously, um, Compute is one of the original OpenStack projects. Um, it forms the basis of the infrastructure of the service offering, uh, along with storage and networking. Uh, I personally would argue that some of the other services we offer uh, things like Solometer for monitoring, heat for orchestration, are really infrastructure as a service plus, um, which in turn are based on these components. Um, so like most OpenStack projects, uh, Compute um, has a number of backends. Uh, so you know, not just Libvirt backends, but also things like vCenter, Hyper-V, and so on. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about the Libvirt driver, and specifically Libvirt KVM. Uh, Libvirt ex itself actually supports uh, a number of virtualization technologies. Um, so the Libvirt driver itself also uh, supports a number of uh, virtualization technologies through the same piece of code. Um, so alongside KVM, uh, we have support for things like uh, the Parallels, LXC containers, um, Xen, um, and so on. Um, so Nova itself is, I, I say, relatively technology agnostic. Uh, so in terms of we're dealing with virtual machines, bare metal, even containers. Um, but the API, just because of the way it was envisaged originally around virtual machines, is a little bit virtual machine specific. Um, so there are some things that are very specific to virtual machines that don't necessarily apply to, for example, containers. Um, when we look at the uh, support matrix, and I'll talk a lot more about this in the talk tomorrow, uh, the broader compute talk, um, but there's a list of things that a compute driver um, must support, and then there's a list of things that are optional. Uh, so what I'm referring to there, again, is that there are actions that a, a compute driver doesn't necessarily have to support because they may not make sense for the underlying technology. Um, so this particular slide, if we break it down at a high level, uh, we have the Nova API. Uh, we have an RPC message bus uh, for communication between the services. We have the conductor for interacting with the database, uh, which means we don't need to have the database creds uh, on every single compute node in the environment and the scheduler responsible uh, for placing instances. So primarily today, we're going to be focusing on that box to the right, uh, the compute node itself. Um, so that is where our instances run. Um, in the Libvirt KVM driver case, uh, the Nova compute service um, that initiates the build of the instance um, is co-located on the same machine as the hypervisor, um, or as, as the QMU and KVM processors. Um, in some of the other drivers, like the vCenter driver, that's not necessarily the case. So Nova Compute may run in another ESX IVM or another hardware and so on and talk to vCenter separately. Um, so Libvirt KVM, uh, based on the latest survey results that came out this week, uh, it's used in 85% of production OpenStack deployments. Uh, that is slightly down from the 87% last time we did the survey. Uh, so that's primarily, if you look at the results, uh, based on an uptick in the usage of Ironic for bare metal management and also some of the container-related uh, drivers. Um, so Libvirt itself, um, and in fact the entire Libvirt QMU KVM stack, uh, provides a free and open source uh, hypervisor effectively. Uh, so Libvirt is itself an abstraction layer, providing an API um, to talk to hypervisors and manage virtual machine life cycles. Um, supports many hypervisor and architectures. So primarily today, I'm kind of implicitly talking about Libvirt KVM uh, slash x86, uh, which I'm most familiar with. But we also have things like in, in KiloCycle, for example, support for KVM on S390 was landed in the uh, Nova driver as well. And there's plenty of other architectures supported too. Um, QMU uh, is effectively the Swiss army knife of virtualization. Uh, so it's a machine emulator. Um, it's able to use dynamic translation uh, so basically run a virtual machine guest uh, without any uh, hardware assistance at all, uh, but that's quite slow. Uh, so we primarily use KVM, uh, the kernel-based virtual machine, uh, to provide hardware, hypervisor assistance or hardware acceleration to those guests. 
Um, so I mentioned libvert being an abstraction layer. Um, you might think, you know, why are we using libvert instead of speaking uh, straight to QMU? Isn't uh, Nova my abstraction layer? Um, so when we look at um, this tiny, tiny print, so this entire command is just the QMU KVM command line for booting a guest in OpenStack without any customization whatsoever. Uh, so this is the out of the box, what you get. Um, and that, as an API, doesn't work so great to talk to. Um, and in the LibVert project, there's a lot of experience in dealing with that. Um, so it's been around for about 10 years, and a lot of stuff has been built into it. Uh, so in that previous command, when we look at you know, what is all this configuration out of, um, that we're getting in the default, you know, it's configuring the CPUs, the NIC presentation to the guest, uh, the disks, the bus type for those disks, whether IDE, VertIO, uh, iSCSI even. Uh, PCI device pass through potentially, or even if without, when we're not using PCI device pass through in the default case, we still have to expose things like, you know, even a virtual machine needs a virtual keyboard, for example, so we can talk to it. Um, consoles, uh, the clock parameters, and so on. Um, the Libvert uh, project also, uh, and its ecosystem, also provides a number of tools that are very useful for working with these virtual machines. Um, so Versh, a CLI for interacting with libvert. Uh, primarily in an OpenStack environment, you won't use this to modify the guest because Nova will just clobber those modifications. Uh, but it's useful for getting out the XML so you can see exactly what was created when you're troubleshooting, for example. Uh, vert Rescue uh, for res running a rescue shell on a virtual machine. Uh, so you know, if on a Saturday when you're preparing for a presentation, you kind of uh, kill your de guest in some unfixable way, you can get in there and uh, sort that out. Um, Vert sysprep for creating templates, uh, Vert V2V v for converting from other environments, Vert sparsify for converting to thin provision. These are all useful tools that have existed for some time and you can use with uh, OpenStack images intended for use with libvert KVM. So I mentioned on my Nova architectural diagram um, that we'd be focusing on the box to the right. Um, so kind of minimizing the control plane here and zooming in on that. Um, so on our hypervisor or our compute node, uh, we have the Nova Compute Service or Agent, uh, which is responsible for communicating with Libvert. Uh, it does that using Libvert's exposed APIs. Uh, Libvert, in turn, uh, launches a QMU process for each guest. Um, I'm being a little bit liberal here because sometimes uh, when you're doing uh, activities like snapshotting or migration or other things, uh, there can be additional QMU processes related to that guest that are involved in doing that. Um, but you know, primarily I would think about it as you know, there's a QMU instance at least uh, for each guest. And then those QMU instances in user space are responsible for talking to KVM in the, hyper, in the kernel uh, to execute commands on the actual hardware as needed. Uh, we also have around uh, kind of the fringes of the driver are useful tools. Uh, there are VertIO drivers uh, for providing paravirtualized para device access uh, to virtual machines. This provides a speed improvement, uh, for example, um, you know, the vast majority of users would primarily use VertIO Net uh, instead of the default um, emulated device, and similarly, uh, VertIO Block instead of IDE uh, for performance reasons. Um, so these days, those drivers are included in uh, the vast majority of Linux-based operating systems, if not all. Uh, they're also available for Windows users as well. Um, QMU Guest Agent optionally runs inside guests, uh, facilitates interaction uh, either by users or management platforms. Um, so that, that they can run something inside the guest effectively. Uh, we'll talk a little bit actually in the Kilo features about uh, an example of how that's used. Um, but just uh, from a, a basic point of view, it just provides an API for doing things that you need to get into the guest to do. So extracting the IP address, for example, or something like that, um, or even initiating snapshots. Um, Venom, kind of topical. Uh, so people who saw the security advisory last week around QMU, uh, and it's using both KVM and Zen environments for that matter. Um, with the Venom vulnerability, uh, there was mitigation of that by using SVIRT. Um, so SVIRT uh, is a framework for effectively defining a policy for what the QMU process is allowed to see. Um, and if it tries to access something that isn't on that list, then it gets denied. Um, because it's named SVIRT, because it was originally a Red Hat project, I think people sometimes assume that this is tied in with SE Linux in a way that you can only use it on Rel or Fedora. Uh, it is actually and always was uh, designed with the idea of multi multiple security backends in mind. Uh, so it is actually something that works with App Armor as well. Uh, so mo most of the time, your distribution should enable this by default. Um, if you're disabling it for some reason, probably don't do that. 
Um, the VIF drivers, uh, so this is getting more into the Nova specific side of things when we talk about the driver architecture. Uh, so there is a concept of a virtual interface driver, uh, which defines how we plug and unplug uh, NIC devices from the guest. Uh, what that means in practical terms is that a different interface type in libvirt has a slightly different XML incantation uh, to attach it. Um, you don't need to think about this too much from a user point of view usually these days because there's a libvirt generic VIF driver uh, responsible for plugging um, all of the most common device types. Um, it is not pluggable easily um, by out of tree implementations anymore, which is a bit of a sticking point. Um, but there's something that's being looked at for Liberty that might ease some of the pain around that without making it fully pluggable. Um, so just by way of example, um, when we're looking at the difference between uh, a pass-through device and a vhost user device uh, as generated by the VIF driver or the, um, the vif.py file. Um, so we can see that it, the interface type is different, direct versus vhost user. Um, they're both um, using the same MAC address. In this case, the model type is vertio in both cases, but the source device is different. So in the first example, we're using the physical ETH0. Uh, in the second example, we're actually using a Unix socket. Uh, volume drivers are conceptually similar, uh, except there's no generic driver. Uh, so there is a very, very long list of them. Uh, in this particular example, I just put in a few. Uh, the same idea basically applies. It's, it's telling libvirt what it needs to put in the XML so that you can attach that type of volume. Um, moving into the Kilo features section, um, and I mentioned primarily I'll be focusing on performance features. Um, so some of this stuff actually started off in Juno. Um, so some things you'll see on the list, uh, numeralware scheduling, for example, I think, wasn't that in Juno? Well, yes, uh, but I would position the Kilo versions as kind of the most or well, the first kind of usable baseline uh, where you can combine all these things together um, and have them play relatively nice. Um, so we have the ability to pin uh, virtual CPU cores to physical CPU cores, albeit implicitly, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. Uh, the ability to back guess memory with huge pages. Um, Numeraware scheduling, uh, both the extension to cover memory binding, uh, IO device locality awareness, and to be honest, just general cleanup of a number of bugs in that area. Um, so when we talk about CPU pinning, um, so there's in Juno, uh, there was a new topology filter added to the scheduler um, to have it have the ability um, to take into account the new topology of the host when scheduling. Um, this kind of needs to be done in two places actually. So you know we need to be aware of the new topology of the hosts when scheduling um, and what cores and uh, which nodes they're in are available, uh, but also on the agent we need to have that same information to then build the guest in the correct way on the other side. Uh, so the new topology filter was extended to add the concept of a dedicated resource guest. Um, so unlike uh, perhaps a typical uh, virtualization environment, uh, say like VMware or Red Hat Enterprise virtualization, um, we don't explicitly from a user perspective say, you know, this is the exact CPU core I want, pin my uh, vCPU to that. Um, because we're not supposed to have awareness in a cloud environment of exactly how the hardware looks from that point of view. Um, so to simplify and abstract that out a little bit, um, the concept is applied in a way that you say in your guest request that I want this guest to have dedicated resources. Then the scheduler and the compute agent are responsible for finding uh, available cores to pin that guest to effectively. Um, you are trading off when you do this the ability to overcommit memory uh, and CPU. Um, so the new topology filter and the agent code do that implicitly for you, um, but you need to be aware of that. So there's a performance, uh, performance trade-off to be made in the fact that you're getting you know, dedicated cores, dedicated memory, um, but as a result, your consolidation ratios aren't as good. Uh, and just mentioning at the end there, and I'll go through this in an example actually, uh, you also need to combine um, these, these ex uh, configurable um, options with existing uh, techniques for isolating cores. So for example, uh, if I have you know, four CPU cores in my host and I uh, pin guests to all of those, my host processes and my vSwitch are still bouncing around somewhere inside that node. Um, so you're not getting the deterministic performance you're probably after unless you also pin host processes somewhere. Um, so looking at an example, uh, very basic NUMA hardware layout, um, so I'm just using NUMA control here to dump um, what it's seeing. 
Uh, so I have on the left, you'll see node 0 and node 1, the two NUMA cells or NUMA nodes available. Um, NUMA node 0 has CPUs 0, 1, 2, and 3, so four CPU cores. Uh, NUMA node 1 has 4, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, in each case, they have around 8 gig of memory available. Um, in some newer systems, uh, you can also get an I.O. layout associated with this. Um, so PCI devices or PCIe lanes uh, can be associated with a specific NUMA node as well. Um, and you can see in the bottom there, it also shows me the node distances. So we see there uh, that access from node 0 to node 0 is obviously closer uh, than accessing node 1 from node 0. And that applies mainly to your memory in this particular case, but also to the I.O. devices uh, in architectures where that's supported on chipsets where that's supported, rather. Uh, so visualizing that a little bit, this is just a diagrammatic representation of that same thing. Um, and to explain what I, I mean by access being slower, so if I'm on core 0 in this example, uh, and I need to access memory uh, that's in node 1's memory banks, um, then I have to go through the interchange bus, and that's going to add a performance penalty versus if I'm accessing uh, memory local to the node I'm on. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that Versh allows you to dump the XML, uh, not just related to the guests actually, but also related to the host, so libvert's representation of what it's seeing. Uh, in this particular case, this is just an excerpt. Uh, so we see here that I'm looking at cell ID 0 in this particular case. We see my 8 gig of memory uh, exposed as kilobytes here. Uh, it also shows um, in the pages element. Um, so all of my pages in this particular example are 4K. I have no huge pages, uh, which is the next line down there. The 2048 is 2 meg huge pages. I have none of them in this example. And then at the bottom, I have my series of CPUs, starting with CPU ID 0, 1, and the alignment they have uh, with specific NUMA nodes. Um, so I'm going to walk through a little bit of an example uh, of configuring this. Um, so in this example, um, I'm going to try and set it up with that hardware, um, hardware layout I just showed. I'm going to set up CPU pinning based on that. Um, so first of all, I have to enable the NUMA topology filter, um, and typically the aggregate inst instance extra specs filter as well. Uh, so NUMA topology filter is obviously taking account for my host topology. Um, the aggregate filter is used um, because I want to segregate the machines on which I run uh, guests that need dedicated resourcing uh, from the rest of them. So the ones I, need I want dedicated uh, resourcing on, I need to take some additional configuration steps to make sure they're ready for that. Uh, so in this particular example, um, I'm going to reserve, uh, for the purposes of running uh, guests, uh, CPU cores 2, 3, 6, and 7. Um, so what that means is that I'm reserving two cores out of four on each of my nodes, uh, keeping in mind that this is a fairly contrived example, um, but stay with me. Um, and what the ISO LCPU's uh, kernel parameters are doing is telling the host kernel, basically, do not schedule processes to these cores. Um, now, it still will allow you to schedule uh, processes to those cores if you explicitly pin them, uh, which is, of course, what we're going to do. Um, using the vCPU pin set uh, 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 variable in Nova.conf, uh, we're going to express basically the same thing. So this is telling uh, libvirt and QMU, and specifically the libvirt driver, hey, this is where I want you to run the virtual machines. So it's going to explicitly, uh, even without any further configuration, um, if we're not doing CPU pinning, it will put uh, pinning ranges um, into the uh, guest XML to ensure that your virtual machines are running on the cores specified in this variable. And you can specify a range. So uh, for example, so if I was giving the entire uh, first NUMA node, um, to running guests, so I would specify the range of 0 to 3, for example. Um, and just this is a visual representation of what I'm trying to do. So I'm reserving uh, implicit. It's kind of the reverse, because I specify uh, that I want 2, 3, 6, and 7 to be isolated from the kernel scheduler. Um, implicitly, that means that the rest of the cores, so 0, 1, 4, and 5, are being used for host processes. Um, and you know, realistically, in an environment that cares about this kind of stuff, like a network function virtualization or a packet processing use case, um, I would pin my vSwitch to one of those cores, for example. So in terms of setting up um, the guest, um, we have the op opportunity to specify whether we want the instance to be dedicated. Um, either in this case, I'm going to use the flavor extra specifications. You can actually also do it from an image property, if I recall correctly. Uh, but in this particular case, I've 
pre-created a flavor called m1.small.performance. Uh, so it's basically just a copy of m1.small, but I'm adding this configuration key. Uh, so CPU policy equals dedicated. And then on the Nova boot command, I simply specify my image as usual and this new flavor I've created um, to create my instance. So we look, take a look at the resulting uh, guest live at XML for the guest. Um, so vCPU placement is static, um, but it would have been before actually as well. Um, but what it does give me in addition is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the vCPUs um, of my guest and the physical CPU cores on the host. So we can see here that uh, vCPU or virtual CPU zero is explicitly pinned uh, to the second CPU core or CPU core two um, on the host. And similarly, uh, virtual CPU one is pinned to number three. Uh, we also, in this example, you can see, uh, have pinned uh, what's referred to the emulator thread. Uh, so this is an additional QEMU process associated with a guest. Um, in the current implementation, it is pinned uh, to the union uh, of the allocated CPUs. Uh, so the emulator thread will still move around between those two CPUs. Uh, that's something we may look at uh, tuning further or providing other options for in the future. Uh, but that's the default implementation for now. Um, when we go further down in the output, we'll also find that the memory uh, is strictly aligned to the NUMA node. Uh, so this is relatively new ability to do this in um, not just QME, but also the kernel. Um, and it only, if I recall correctly, will work when you're in KVM mode. Uh, so you can't use this using uh, QME emulation. You have to have the hardware acceleration. Um, but you can see here that the memory backing for this particular guest is pinned to node zero as well, or cell zero. Um, so moving on and now combining this with huge pages. Uh, so in that previous example, my host didn't have any huge pages defined yet. Um, huge pages allow us to use uh, larger page sizes for our memory, um, which include, improves our uh, cache efficiency. Um, so effectively, instead of requesting over and over again 4K pages, obviously if I can request once a one gig page, I'm gonna have a faster lookup time, but there's pros and cons to that as well. Um, so we're primarily dealing with on x86, uh, two meg and one gig huge pages. Um, so allowing these, um, the other thing I should mention is these can't be overcommitted. So if I'm using huge pages, um, then my, again, my memory um, overcommit is gone. Um, and different workloads are gonna exhibit different characteristics uh, when using huge pages. So uh, there are workloads that benefit from two meg huge pages, but may not benefit from one gig huge pages, for example. You, it really takes some profiling to work out exactly what the right fit is. Um, bigger is not always better. Um, so in terms of the process for setting, setting this up, um, an administrator uses the normal Linux tools for reserving huge pages during compute node setup, uh, and then creates some flavors to match. Again, you can also do some of this from image properties. Um, so just taking a look at an example here. Um, so I mentioned I have to allocate the huge pages I want uh, up front on kernel boot uh, in this particular case. Uh, so I'm requesting uh, 2048 two megabyte huge pages. Um, which is, of course, enough to back a four gig guest, which is what I'm going to create for this example. Um, again, just, this is a relatively contrived example um, for the purposes of this um, presentation. Um, there's obviously uh, a lot more involved, but there's also a lot of very exotic uh, hardware configurations once you get into some of the numerous stuff as well, uh, depending on what chipsets are in use and so on. Uh, so I use Grub to set that, or Grubby to set that up. I install uh, to the master boot record. I reboot my machine. Uh, and then I take a look and see where my huge pages are at. Uh, by default, um, when you specify the huge pages uh, the way I did, um, the system will simply split them equally over the number of Numa nodes you have. Uh, so in this particular case, I have two Numa nodes, uh, so I get 1,024 of those huge pages on each side. Um, similarly, we can see when I run Versh capabilities um, that the allocation for the Numa node has changed. Uh, I now have 1,024 on each node. Um, so I'm reusing uh, my m1.small.performance uh, uh, flavor. I'm adding the keyword that I want the mem page size of 2048. Um, you can also obviously request the one gig huge, huge pages, um, or there is also uh, shortcuts um, where you can specify small or large, but for the purposes of this architecture, it is basically the same thing, so it doesn't make a lot of difference. And then I obviously boot my guest uh, using that flavor. Uh, and we, when we dump the XML, uh, we can see that the memory backing has been changed uh, to use those huge pages on node zero. 
or unknown zero where possible, sorry, is more accurate. Um, so moving on to the PCIe example, um, so we're using the same host here. Um, most, well, more modern um, x86 chipsets uh, have, have the PCIe lanes uh, associated with a given NUMA node. Um, and it's basically the same principle as with the memory stuff. Um, so if I'm on core zero and I'm using a physically uh, passed through device and that device is attached to node one, then I'm not going to get the same performance I would if it was attached to node zero. Um, so again, some extensions to the NUMA topology filter allow it to take use of, make use of this information where it's available. Uh, for chipsets that don't expose it, it will make no difference. All right, so that was kind of the wrap on the performance features. Um, I have also started and I'm working on a series of blog posts to work on those in a more expanded basis. Uh, but now I'm just moving on to some more general uh, features in the driver for this uh, Kilo release. Um, so libvirt uh, 1.25 and higher, or greater than 1.25, sorry, um, supports uh, the ability to use um, something that was recently added to the QAMU guest agent. So that's, as a reminder, the agent that can run inside the guest and perform actions on that side. Uh, and it's what's called a, free, a freeze thaw API. So what that means is that I can tell the guest I want to freeze the file system um, so that I can take a snapshot and ensure that snapshot is consistent or quiesce the file system, sorry. Um, and then when I'm done snapshotting, I can thaw it again uh, to allow the guest aid or the guest to start modifying uh, the disk again. Um, so there's a very useful ability uh, for um, creating consistent snapshots or ensuring consistent snapshots um, currently. Uh, the way to enable that, so when we have the guest agent inside a guest image, uh, we need to set the uh, QMU guest agent image property uh, to yes to show that it's there so that Nova knows it's there um, because we don't really in Nova at this time have a lot of introspection inside the guest yet other than what we get via these agents. Um, and for the guests where we want to use this capability, we need to set the require FS freeze image property to yes. Um, if these things are set up, uh, the when snapshotting, uh, this will be implicitly taken care of for you, so there's nothing to do after that point. So it's primarily a guest um, creation and setup um, thing when you're creating the image. Um, this was actually not uh, a blueprint, um, but a bug fix, or treated as a bug fix. Um, so Hyper-V um, supports a number of additional para-virtualization features, um, so particularly for Windows, so it provides an enhanced um, experience for Windows guests running on top of Hyper-V. Um, and actually, uh, Linux guests also support those these days. So there's contributions in the kernel that allow them to take advantage of these features when they're running on Windows hypervisors. Um, on Libvirt KVM on Linux, uh, we have the ability to emulate a number of these features. Um, and in particular, uh, and the reason this was primarily treated as a bug fix, is that for certain Windows versions, uh, when they're running on heavily loaded hosts, um, you can encounter a blue screen of death uh, if these um, particular features aren't present or exposed to the guest. Um, so to take advantage of those, we expanded the behavior of the existing um, OS type equals Windows image property. Uh, so there is an image property you can set which says this guest of is, is of type Windows and then some customization of the XML and the virtual hardware presented to that guest will be done based on that. Um, support for vhost user. Um, so vhost user um, is a new type of network interface implemented in QAMU and libvirt. Um, it's intended to provide a more efficient path between a guest and user space switches. Um, it becomes particularly interesting, um, not just in normal OVS use cases, but as we look to things like OVS and DPDK acceleration uh, when they combine together. Uh, so the VIF driver is there at the moment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about in the Liberty uh, look forward, uh, what more we need to do around that. So Liberty predictions. Um, so I mentioned at the start, and I'll highlight again, that you know, this is a fairly critical time in the cycle um, for determining uh, what we're actually going to achieve in the next six months. Um, so these are all in varying states of discussion and review. Um, and this is just kind of my read on stuff that looks like um, I'll say it, it's likely to happen. Um, but this is, again, just me speculating primarily. Um, so libvirt hardware policy from libos info. Um, so we touched on the OS type um, uh, image property for telling Nova what type of guest is running. And we said for that particular Hyper-V Enlightenment example that we're saying OS type equals Windows. And the, the obvious question when you think about that is, 
Does that mean Windows 3.1? Does that mean Windows XP? Windows ME? Probably not. Um, and so on. And you know, not just in the Windows world, but there's also um, some versions of BSD and other guests are also very sensitive to some of the timer information. Um, so we want to get a little bit more granularity in what we're doing there so that we're more explicit about exactly what guests we're talking about. Um, because obviously, you know, when we look at something like XP now versus the latest versions of Windows, uh, the workarounds we had to apply for XP are potentially quite different from the ones we need to apply for newer versions. Um, so LibOS Info provides kind of an agreed upon uh, form for expressing this information. Um, so the idea is first to expand the use of the OS type uh, variable or image property so that it can at least uh, take this format and use that format. Um, ideally, where we'd like to get to, and it's probably beyond Liberty Cycle, to be honest, uh, would be introspection to actually be able to determine the guest without the user having to explicitly tell us. Um, but that's kind of an extrapolation of this or what's proposed currently. Uh, Post-plug VIF scripts. Um, so I mentioned that the VIF driver interface is not pluggable um, because it's not really a stable API to b begin with. Um, and this causes some issues because it means if someone, uh, or if a networking vendor uh, wants to add a VIF, they have to land it in the, in the Nova tree before anyone can really use it at the moment, or they have to apply patches to people's distributions and so on. Um, and one of the main reasons they're typically doing this is not because they're not using one of the already defined interfaces, um, but because they have to do some additional customization or calls to their vSwitch or setting up flows or that kind of thing um, after plugging the interface. Um, so to get around that or to help them uh, find a solution that's more in the middle, um, what's proposed at the moment and what's been discussed a little bit and still under review um, is the idea of allowing for a post-plug script um, so that people could use, for example, the generic uh, vhost user vif driver, um, but then run some ex additional logic um, that they can plug um, externally uh, to do whatever they need to do on their vSwitch. Um, there's a lot of discussion around further work around SROV device pass-through. Um, and there's a number of other blueprints related to this, but the, the primary two um, that seem to have the most interest at the moment are the ability to attach and detach um, pass through interfaces from a running guest. So at the moment, you have to attach the device at the, or the port at the time you're booting the guest. Um, you can't change it afterwards. Um, and also the ability to do live migration of guests um, with SRO to V devices. But there's a little bit of a catch there in that live migration of those guests is only going to work where we're using the Mac VTAP pass through mode. Uh, we're effectively creating a virtual device in between. Um, it won't work when we're doing direct pass-through, um, and Mac VTAP has a bit of a performance uh, penalty involved with it. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, you can have maximum performance, but you're trading off live migration, and that applies to a few other things in Nova as well. Um, the ability to be more explicit about what CPU model and or features a guest wants. Um, so there is actually a filter, a scheduler filter at the moment that can be used to say, um, this guest needs to run on a host with these CPU features. Uh, the problem with that is that it doesn't actually check um, what host model um, that particular node is exposing to the guest. So, all right, I landed on a, get on a host that has you know, AEX or whatever, AES or whatever feature it is I wanted, but I may not be getting exposed to that in my guest anyway. Um, so there's a couple of proposals and a discussion around how to resolve that issue in a way that we have what we actually intended, which is the guest not only goes on a CPU that has that feature, but that is exposing that feature to virtual machines. Um, virtual machine HA, uh, I put on here because there's a lot of interest in it. It's not actually primarily an inside Nova thing to implement, um, but there is some discussion about having uh, the ability for external tools like Pacemaker or Keep Alive D or other high availability tools um, that are already um, well established as ways to detect failure. Um, the ability to tell Nova, hey, this failed, um, and what they're doing um, in reaction to that. So the bulk of the HA work is actually in Pacemaker and um, Keep Alive D and other high availability solutions and the way people are deploying those. Um, but there is also this proposal for an API call in Nova for them to tell it what it's doing. Uh, there's a couple of little tweaks around Vertio performance enhancements uh, under discussion. Um, one of the challenges with those is how to abstract those enough that you are giving a good, a good experience to the generic cloud use case and also enough customizability to people really pushing the boundaries. And that's very challenging with some of these um, because they are, you know, for example, Vertio multi-queues uh, is 
uh, a way to enhance performance in terms of increasing the number of queues associated with a VertIO device for processing traffic um, that is very specific to the VertIO driver. And as a result, in a, in a cloud model, it's, it's difficult to abstract that enough. Um, I, should, I should have mentioned that as I go down these, I get to the ones I have less confidence in, um, just, just from my own take. Um, so hot resize I put up here, um, which is kind of like not the first time it's been proposed. Uh, so this is the idea of uh, most modern hypervisors, if not all, have the ability these days to add and remove CPUs, RAM, um, on the fly, uh, so at runtime. Um, and the idea is to implement an equivalent of the uh, resize function, or cold resize, uh, to do it on the fly as well in Nova. Um, whether or not that happens or not, we'll see. Um, so that's the end of what I have for today. Um, again, if people are interested in breaking up, um, you know, blowing up compute itself and taking a, quite, uh, a look at the wider architecture, um, I'll be back here the same time tomorrow doing that. Uh, I'll also take any questions people have.